it's recorded for those that maybe had something come up today. So, as many of you know, we just recently hosted our 2017 AHAB Annual Conference. It was in Dallas, Texas, actually at the Omni Las Colinas, which is, uh, Las Colinas is a small community outside of Dallas. Um, and we had an opportunity to gather as healthcare professionals in disaster preparedness and learn from some of our leaders in the field and, um, and allow um, people to congregate and network. And, and we really had a great opportunity to, um, to have a really good week learning and networking. Um, so pulling some of the things. So our agenda, for those of you that aren't familiar with what we had on our agenda, um, we had Dr. Mark Hosey as a, our keynote speaker opening. We'll, I'm mean, going to just kind of do a quick overview of what was on our agenda, and then we'll go into some of our, um, our actual programs. Um, we had a Collaborate with Colleagues uh, activity, and that is kind of my baby. I always want everybody to start our conferences with an opportunity to strong, strongly network. Uh, and, and learn each other's names and uh, learn each other's expertise so that they have an opportunity to start working together and just right off the get-go. Um, we had a whole uh, CMS boot camp track uh, that encompassed the entire two days, so various topics that CMS has as requirements. Um, we had pediatric surge, um, psychological effects of survivors of mass tragedies, um, social media and um, social media analysis and response. We had um, planning. We had disaster exercise represented, uh, lessons learned from events. We had liability um, regarding healthcare and continuity planning. Um, dealing with threats today, violence in healthcare, uh, touched on the opioid e epidemic. Um, we had a, a keynote address from CC Blondio uh, from CMS. Um, so we we actually got a one of our people from CMS uh, in a room with two doors, and I was guarding the other one. So she got hammered with all the questions that everybody wanted answered, um, and we got an opportunity to really interact with um, those represented res representatives from CMS. Um, we had an optional session to discuss the model of practice in emergency management. Uh, and then our day two, um, we had hospital uh, mass casualty. Dr. Paul Bettinger got in, um, got in front of us and talked to us about that, what we can do um, to improve our mass casualty incident response. Uh, resource allocation, um, legal and ethical, um, violent extremism, planning, more planning, um, more CMS, um, regional planning, coalitions, uh, pretty much all kinds of topics related to disaster preparedness and healthcare. We touched on PEDS, we touched on more exercise measurement. Asked for Tracy, and then we had um, a keynote to wrap up all of our conference um, on the future of ASPR funding. Uh, and unfortunately, Ed Gabriel was slotted for that uh, presentation, and he ended up at the last minute unable to attend due to some uh, response needs in Puerto Rico. But we did have somebody fill in on that presentation from ASPR. So um, kind of a summary of what I, I saw in our agenda, um, and Keith is going to, to just kind of butt in if he has things to add, um, but we're kind of co-presenting with me doing the majority um, so that we don't get him into a coughing fit. Um, but the agenda had lots of focus on the CMS rule, um, and we had a full track on CMS rule compliance. Um, we're starting to see research in preparedness, which we haven't seen a lot of that in the past. Um, and we were very excited to see some of the research and those studies coming out and being presented on. Um, we've heard a lot of um, response from not only the people that presented pediatrics and preparedness, but um, even our audience that pediatrics and preparedness is 
is an underserved topic and it is there is a great need for that. Um, planning and exercise is a major component. Um, acts of violence are still a major concern um, and a lot of times what I'm seeing in most presentations regarding acts of violence, um, whether it be um, some type of active shooter situation and or um, in relationship to the uh, up and coming <coughs> opioid crisis is that um, there's still a lot of, of things that people are unsure of as what to do. Um, so, so that is some of the things that we're seeing. So, um, <clears throat> hello everyone, this is Keith. Um, Christy has a nice little summary of, of what I think are coming up, some of the highlights of the agenda here. And uh, I attended, of course, not all the sessions. I couldn't actually do that and probably didn't attend uh, nearly as many as I wanted. But some of the takeaways I got from, from this list uh, in particular uh, were, I think, really important. For instance, she, ta she talked about the research and preparedness. Paul Benninger gave a really excellent uh, keynote presentation and uh, <clears throat> was actually... Uh, talk quite a bit about uh, mass casualty incidents and mass ca MCI, mass casualty incidents, MCI, uh, MCI epidemiology, for those of you that are uh, familiar with public health. Uh, pub epidemiology is the study of the distribution and determinants of uh, illness and injury in a, in a community. <clears throat> and they're doing much more research on the uh, epidemiology of MCI. And some of the things he talked about was that uh, based upon studies of multiple, for instance, active shooter uh, events, they came out with a, a, a short list of things to expect. For instance, uh, patients will flee if they're able to, and they'll hop into cop cars and private vehicles and, and go somewhere either on their own or, or be taken by a friend. And I think a lot of our planning and exercising in the past has been people are laying on the ground and we move them to red, green, and yellow tarps, and then we then we take them to facilities. And the actual research is showing that that's not the case. Um, the research is also showing that bystanders will try to assist, which uh, I think many of us had in the back of our head. I don't think we plan for that very much, um, and I'm not sure exactly what that planning looks like, but but it, it's something that happens on a regular basis. So do we? is there a way that we can either take advantage of that or, or uh, uh, funnel that productively? Um, for healthcare facilities, he talked about some of the findings about uh, walk-ins may actually be the official notification of the event. There may be nothing prior to people actually walking into the ED uh, that have been in the event, and there's your notification. There you go. He also talked a little bit about, you know, we plan for this kind of, we can stand up our surge in 20 minutes, and they're finding that the average patients are showing up after these types of events in about four. So it's the 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 epidemiology I think is is teaching us some things that uh, uh, some planning assumptions I think that we made that may not have been accurate. So that's what I'm is really exciting to me about some of the research that's going on. Um, Anna Hansen, who's also in the room with us now, uh, facilitated uh, our first ever uh, research group uh, within AHAP, and and we're actually putting together the scope and mission of that group because we think that this is uh, important that uh, that research be represented by AHEP and that AHEP have a voice in research that's either being conducted or needs to be conducted. We have a lot of information in after action reports that's that's out there for lack of a better phrase loosey-goosey and it's not it's not collated it's not summarized you know there have to be thousands of after action reports out there that can give us some really solid information, but we need a way to, to analyze that. So this research group is, is looking at those types of issues. Is that accurate? And it's not in, okay, good. <clears throat> That's a good sign. Um, another thing that kind of came up for me in that, in that list is the pediatric conversation, which is always fascinating to me um, because I've heard this probably a dozen times and every time I hear it, it makes sense. And, Pediat peds are not little adults, and she did a really nice job of breaking that down into four different components of the presentation. One is about the biology of pediatrics, 
The second is about the, the development of pediatrics. And when we say development, she's talking about emotional and cognitive uh, emotions and cognition and that type of thing in terms of develop. Also, what she called the entourage of the pediatric patient, which is the aunt and the uncle and the mom and the dad and the brother and the sister and the 17 other family members that are going to show up and be hanging out in your waiting room if they don't, if they stay in the waiting room. So dealing with the entourage is what she calls it. it was It was really fascinating. And she actually broke it down into another component of reunification of the family with the with the patient, and it was it was a nice, nice, different take on uh, a response, disaster response with pediatrics. Not just uh, how does the chemical affect a smaller body. It was it was she did I thought a really nice job. So I'm going to shut up now, Christine. Sorry for a moment. Uh, I'll be back. Don't worry. <laughs> You're fine. Um, yeah. So so. We're just going to move through some of the presentations and keep um, started to touch on some of the major ones um, that that he he was able to attend. Just as we move forward, um, I am seeing a lot of comments going through and chats. And keep them coming. Keep chatting. I'm going to do my best, and Keith is too. Going to do do our best with. Um, kind of tracking with what people are saying, but um, I'm going to just expect that our audience right now is watching some of the, the chat that's going through. I think that what's happening is uh, the people that were there are adding in their comments um, and adding in some of their um, additional things that they would like to say about the program. So um, just just keep, keep all of your comments coming, and I'm going to assume, uh, unless somebody stops me, um, that you guys are all tracking and reading some of the comments, and um, I think yeah, that they're, they're very valuable for everybody to take a look at as we're going through this. Keep those coming. Thank you. That's fantastic. So, uh, Dr. Marcosi, one of the first comments I saw was uh, I saw Dr. Marcosi's presentation, and it was amazing. Uh, yes, he never ceases to amaze me as well. Um, some of the things um, that Dr. Marcosi spoke of this time was uh, turning the page on healthcare preparedness was his, his topic, was his, his title. Um, his key points were that we should not focus on health or that we should focus on healthcare delivery during crisis and not just continue to focus over and over on medical surge. Um, because medical surge is, is not really appropriate and is not getting funded. So what's getting funded and what people are taking notice of um, regarding not necessarily funding, but um, what CMS is encouraging um, is a good healthcare delivery. Um, and that needs to be established and expected during a crisis as well as any normal working day. So um, I thought it was interesting that, um, you know, that's where he feels that preparedness needs to be moving is, is that we just need to be better at providing quality health care uh, no matter what type of response because we really are a response agency and that's just how it's going to be. Um, 955 of the U.S. healthcare providers um, are, or healthcare facilities are private, um, and he thought we should be following referral patterns to find out how patients will seek care in a disaster. This is maybe what we should plan for. Um, to me, this sounds like a research opportunity. This is this is incredible. This is I mean, why didn't why why aren't we thinking of this earlier? Um, Accountable care organizations are already measuring outcomes. Um, why aren't we um, blending our coalition funding with the measure outcomes that are happening with the accountable care organizations already? Um, so that that's a really impressive list for us to you know get started on. These are our marching orders. Um, we need to start um, to strive to create tools to improve efficiency in healthcare. Um, what I took from that, and this is these are not Dr. Marcosi's words, but what I took from that was maybe um, we could start creating better tools in discharge process, um, maybe better tools in the operating room process, because we've already got that tool in place. It's called a timeout. Um, and maybe our bed availability, 
availability needs to be, um, you know, those tools are already in place as well. Maybe we can improve upon them and, and fine tune them. So I think there's a lot of opportunity. And as Dr. Marcosi went through many of, um, much of his presentation, I think he had just um, it, kind of an inspirational view on it, um, in my opinion. I, I was inspired to try to do better. <laughs> um, and, and tr yep. inspired to try to um, look at preparedness uh, and fine tune our response to make sure that what we're doing in preparedness is really getting the most attention and the most funding that we can possibly get um, and not be um, looked at upon as a burdensome task always. This is something that's necessary. It's something that should be ingrained in our processes and something that should just be what we do. Um, and and so I really liked that um, that part of his presentation. Yeah. Did you have anything else to add regarding no, Marcosi's topic? No, I, I kind of started to laugh a little bit when Christy said I, I'm, I'm, I was inspired to do better. And that's really a great summary of kind of how I felt when I walked away from that presentation, too. It was like, okay, we're, we're, we've we've done target capabilities lists. We've done uh, a lot of that stuff that Homeland Security told us to do early on. Uh, it, I think we can do better. And that's kind of, uh, that's kind of where he went. And that's really inspiring to me. Yeah. So moving on, um, our other, one of our other keynote speakers was um, Cece Blondio from CMS. Um, like I said, she was able to um, give us a summary of, oh, I guess my diagram didn't download, um, a summary of all the provisions for all the provider types, which you guys have heard, you have likely, um, if you're on this webinar, I've already heard these things because you should be in compliance already, but risk assessment and planning, policies and procedures, communication plan, training and testing, um, those are all of the t components of CMS. She went through all of those. Um, we were all expected to be in compliance by uh, November 15th. Um, surveyors um, are going to start surveying the emergency preparedness um, in, in these facilities. If they're not compliant, they're going to do the general enforcement procedures um, that they do with any other conditions of participation uh, that aren't, are cited as non-compliant. So when it comes to CMS, um, essentially, from what I gathered from her presentation, is this is just like any other condition of participation. Um, they're going to check, make sure you guys are in compliance, make sure we're all in compliance, and if you're not, you're gonna um, you're gonna see those um, those results that you would see and in, in being non-compliant in any other thing. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Where are we now in September um, 2017? The surveyor um, training um, happened. So the sub surveyors um, were just recently trained on how to survey you um, in disaster preparedness. Uh, if you don't have this link, uh, you should be able to uh, quickly copy it and or um, I can just add it to the list web links later. Um, but uh, that would be something, if you're wondering what your surveyors know, that's probably it, unless they have a background in preparedness. Um, I don't think a lot of preparedness, or I, I don't think a lot of surveyors are, um, are actually heavily trained in this. I don't think a lot of surveyors have a background in preparedness. So truly, what's on that training is probably what they know. So you, you probably, you know, can can be able to fall back on on that's what it is. Um, so they're going to be surveyed um, from from November fifteenth and ongoing. And I personally am curious to find out what some of those surveyors um, are finding um, in the upcoming months and year. Um, I would be, I would be very interested in in maybe having CC back next year and find out uh, what it is that she thinks people are getting cited for, um, and or maybe some of our people that experience surveyors and maybe from a, a receiving facility, uh, the survey process and what they what they really think of it. Um, maybe we won't have CMS in the room for that, so you can give you your real opinions. <laughs> 
<laughs> so, um, so that was um, an, uh, an interesting presentation. A lot of her presentation, I, I would say that probably many of you have studied up on that and, and kind of already knew. Um, so there's another web link uh, regarding some of the certification uh, rules. And so that's, that's that. One thing I did want to touch on is that um, she did emphasize not to lose sight of the intent of the rule. The intent behind the rule is to collaborate and coordinate with emergency officials and improve patient access to care and continuing care during disasters. So really, CMS's goal is the same as Dr. Marcosi's goal, is the same as Dr. Bettinger's goal, is the same as our goal and your goal. We're all in it for the same reason. Um, CMS is just, you know, creating this rule to, in, I guess, ensure engagement. So, so don't lose sight of that. That that's really what their intent is. <clears throat> um, one of the next presentations that um, stood out to me, um, and and I just want to state the caveat that I was unable to attend all the presentations. So the ones that I popped in on are the ones that are probably going to stand out to me and the other ones aren't going to stand out because I didn't get an opportunity to see them. So <laughs> um, we're going to go through and uh, go through some of the uh, other ones that I was involved in and, and take an opportunity to look at these. So using exercises to me measure preparedness. Um, exercise is near and dear to my heart. So um, I thought this was interesting that Dr. Benninger is um, starting to do some research regarding exercise. And one of um, the pieces of research that he is looking at is um, maybe some exercise barriers. And I thought this chart was especially interesting because 90% of the respondents experienced barriers to planning and evaluating exercises. So. Um, most of them were with the quality of evaluator observations. Um, I'm curious if other people, um, especially those of you on the call, are seeing some of this experience regarding your exercise. I know many of you are already doing and participating in exercises, and I'm very curious to know if, um, if you're running into similar of these issues. Um, you know, evaluator, evaluator, evaluator is what I'm seeing um, regarding all of these um, barriers. So um, it's not necessarily planning, maybe lack of time and time to develop the evaluation plan, but again, there you are at the evaluation. Not, I'm not seeing lack of time to develop the actual exercise. I'm seeing a lot of the evaluation is, is the problem. So I think that, you know, maybe in the future that's an opportunity for us to uh, work on and maybe provide some education in is some of the evaluation piece. He had a conceptual model of the key elements of exercise performance management. Um, it is listed there. Um, I, I see again that a lot of this moves into the uh, validity and reliability of the measuring of the assessment within the exercise. Um, this is this is a big deal. Evaluation is important. That's the whole reason we do exercise, and I think we could do it better. So one of the things that they developed was an exercise evaluation toolkit. Again, here's another link for you to grab a hold of. Um, there's a, a toolkit that Harvard um, and Dr. Bettinger worked on together. There's some online training available, um, and there's some, some exercise um, resources there. So if, if you uh, need help with this, this is something that is another tool that, that they, they told us about during the conference. Um, moving on, because I am looking at our clock and realize that we are actually three minutes left of our scheduled oh, webinar. We're scheduled for half an hour. I oh. think so. Or were we scheduled for an hour? Maybe we're scheduled sure. for an hour. <clears throat> I hope I, we're scheduled for an hour. I can talk more. <laughs> If we go over and you need to leave, just know that I'm recording this and I will oh, um, I will post this online. So if you were only planning to stay for a half hour, um, feel free to, to go on to your next meeting. If you were planning on staying for a full hour, we'll probably uh, take all that time. If, if you leave, you'll miss me talking more. <laughs> just fair warning. 
Okay, so resource allocation and disasters, um, legal and ethical considerations. Um, this was, we had a, an attorney come to speak at our annual conference this year. Um, some, some people think that's a pro, some people think that's a con. Um, but um, we did have an attorney uh, give us some information. Um, and I think that this is really helpful uh, as we develop our plans, as we start looking at our plans and evaluating some of our plans. Um, what is the law? I mean, this, this is kind of a big deal um, that, that we need to know what our law is regarding um, preparedness as we develop our plans. So um, basically, what's the role of the law in disasters? She, she touched on that. Um, it is to help define public health or another emergency, help create infrastructure, um, help authorize performance um, and the actions and to determine the extent of responsibility for potential or actual harms that arise during emergencies. So those, though, that is where the law permeates emergency response at every level. So um, the, the um, person that spoke on on the resource allocation and the, the legal and ethical considerations also touched on the CDC uh, control of communicable disease regulations. Those are new and um, those have been in effect since March of 2017. Um, it gives the CDC broad authority to detain people across the country without approval from state, local, um, state and local officials. Um, this was really uh, specifically of interest uh, during the Ebola um, outbreak. So, th so that's really where that came in. Um, and just kind of an overarching caveat to all of this entire presentation, um, our attorney, um, she wanted to present a lot of case studies um, and show us uh, the law through case studies. And so um, that's what she did. Didn't, didn't provide us a lot of um, Specified solutions. There was a lot of what ifs and um, think abouts, but not any, uh, not many anyway, um, a solid solutions. Um, so I think that, you know, that, that to me uh, speaks to me in a way that, you know, maybe we need more research and studies and um, work done in this area of preparedness because I don't think there are solid answers to some of our questions out there. Um, she really described the, the role of the law is kind of um, the courts are going to play that critical role as the intermediary um, to balance the rights of individuals and the need to protect public health. Um, and so I think we've all known that um, for, for quite some time. Um, and many of us work in public health and respect public health. Um, but, but truly, when you're in the thick of, um, you know, needing to protect public health versus rights of individuals, um, I think that that we all want to protect public health. And then when it's happening to yourself, um, <laughs> you probably don't don't want to be, uh, you know, your rights being impeded on. Um, so, so I specifically understand that this week uh, because I had a child that was homesick from school. Um, so what I really wanted to do with Sender, I knew that that was not good for public health. Um, <laughs> so um, she touched on what's the scope of practice uh, and um, the activities and procedures that somebody's, um, someone in a regulated profession is authorized to engage. So um, are you authorized to treat Patients, um, do you have the appropriate education and training, licensure? Um, do you have the correct state licensure? Um, that is something that the law is quite obviously involved in. Um, and then um, she also talked about triggers for shifting to crisis standards of care. So uh, formal emergency de declaration is um, kind of a gold standard when it comes to uh, crisis standards of care, but uh, there's a lot of other things that could actually be a trigger uh, that that was interesting to me because I didn't really think of the fact that you know a trigger for shifting to crisis of care could be 
loss of essential services and then we automatically you know shift to crisis of standards of care well we do that um, that's something we do that's something we plan for um, is it formally crisis standard standard of care um, apparently according to the law it is so that was interesting um, you know medical surge could possibly trigger crisis standards of care. Um, you know, shortage of meds and ventilators, we've all been talking about that with all of our pandemic planning. We know that. Um, and or shortage of providers. I mean, my goodness, we talk and talk about the fact that the baby, baby boomers are retiring and we're going to have a shortage of care providers um, just because our population change. Um, so, that that could be a possible trigger, you know, without being any kind of event at all. Um, so so very interesting to me on that. Um, she mentioned this, the challenges to crisis standards. Um, some events have never or rarely occurred, so there's no evidence base. So <laughs> when uh, the law does 90% of their their uh, practice by case study and there isn't a case study available, um, I would say that that's quite a challenge. Um, so um, practitioners also may end up working outside their scope of practice. Um, that's being talked about all the time when you guys talk about planning um, and it's, it's talk being talked about uh, here in the other um, part of my job actually. We talk about um, practitioners uh, going outside of their scope of practice and planning for that uh, regarding, uh, you know, challenges during a disaster. Um, broken down communication um, can cause crisis standards and, and challenges. So there's a lot of things, there, there's a lot of what ifs, what ifs, what ifs uh, that we need to really think through. Um, but I'm not necessarily telling you or did I garner uh, any true answers from that presentation. No. No. Um, Ready for me? Are you, I thought you were going to talk. I can, absolutely. <laughs> Did you have um, I can't wait. Oh, okay. <laughs> Only if you're done, though. I'm done with, okay, yeah. Because that's obnoxious. Well, we have, right. we have more oh. slides. Okay. But um, that there, <coughs> do you have more on this presentation? No, I don't. Okay. Not on this one. Nope, keep going. Okay, so then um, I'll just keep going through the slides and then we'll let, um, I'll let Keith talk eventually, I promise. <laughs> um, one of the uh, next presentations that I was allowed, um, that I was able to attend was uh, Manya Chalinski, um, and she spoke of the psychological after effects for survivors. Um, so this was, again, something new that, um, that we hadn't experienced in the past, uh, haven't heard from a survivor. So um, that that's an interesting um, perspective, and I think we don't get an opportunity to hear those as many times as we'd like to. Some of those those things that those responses that survivors really have to say. What I gathered from this one, um, and she was obviously talking about psychological after effects, is um, that, you know, we can say Boston strong, Las Vegas strong, every, every other event um, strong, um, but what if the person that experienced this isn't as strong as they should be, can be, think they need to be? Um, so, you know, that was an interesting thing. Um, you know, all of, all of these events, uh, we, we push that we need to be strong and push through and continue on with day to day. Um, but mentally, um, I can only imagine how very difficult that is. Um, she went through some of the symptoms of post-traumatic stress um, regarding re-experiencing symptoms. Flashbacks, uh, frightened thoughts, avoidance symptoms, which would be staying away from the reminders of the trauma, um, staying away from places, events, objects, um, uh, reactivity symptoms, um, getting easily startled or feeling tense or on edge, difficulty sleeping, um, outbursts of anger, um, cognition and mood symptoms, um, trouble remembering key features of the event, negative thoughts, distorted feelings, loss of interest in enjoyable activities, 
all of these were um, things that she went through and um, you know identified with some of some of these um, it's it's interesting um, and I don't think we look at this information enough uh, especially when it comes to our healthcare providers and what they experience during a traumatic uh, incident response um, so I think we need to continue to look at these response or at, at this, um, this psychological after effect and keep trying to improve our preparedness. Um, her suggestion regarding preparedness is to help the community organizations plan um, from that medical perspective, um, make sure that lists of resources um, are available during an emergency, create policies and your organization to build resiliency and deal with stress if you haven't already. Um, obviously there is a number of um, advocacy opportunities when it comes to these events and the PTSD um, for healthcare workers. Um, laws in your state or region may need to change. So um, it's it's pretty important um, that you uh, get involved as a healthcare provider to allow for that. Um, make sure that you communicate that it's normal to feel traumatized and um, you tr use traditional and social media to share stories. Um, she suggested that as well. <clears throat> Build resiliency. She, she uh, definitely thought we should be um, building that resiliency for our victims and or our health care providers that have experienced some of those um, terrible events that they maybe can't deal with on their own. Um, obviously, you guys can read some of those things. Um, I think that there are important pieces of that that need to be uh, touched upon and followed through. Um, again, just another opportunity in our preparedness and possibly in our upcoming conferences is the mental health piece. Uh, it's just something that I don't think it covered um, as, as frequently and as in-depth as it might need to be. Uh, the last one that I have, and then you can listen to Keith's talk, um, is the uh, violence in healthcare, opioid abuse, and changing, env changing environment of healthcare. Um, basically, what I learned from this presentation was um, that there is still serious workplace violence happening. Um, even though we train a lot on um, maybe spouses, angry spouses coming in and um, causing a mass event or causing, you know, various uh, active shooter events um, or, or co-workers getting angry or, or clients and customers getting angry, 80% of serious workplace violence in healthcare is happening from the patient. And, uh, you know, when it comes to some of his surveys that he's done, um, you know, the, the highest receivers of those are psychiatric aids, EMS, and nursing assistants. Um, so that, that was interesting to me that a lot of the, the victims and the assailants are still um, the same as what we've always had, uh, even though the big events that get all of the media um, are the ones that people really think of when they think about violence in the workplace and violence in healthcare setting. Um, he touched very little on the opioid um, epidemic, excuse me, epidemic, um, but I thought that this these slides were worth um, showing that. Uh, nearly, or that 142 Americans die every day from a drug overdose, um, and nearly two thirds of those overdoses in 2015 were linked to opioids. Um, Americans consume more opioids in, than any other country, and in 2015, the amount of opioids prescribed in the U.S. was enough for every American to be medicated around the clock for three weeks. Um, so that is, you know, that that's a a big fact right there and I think it's really important to take note of. Um, is there a correlation between opioids and workplace violence? Well, um, when there is opioid abuse, 
um, there is intimate partner violence that increases um, in the 1970s. The heroin crisis was violent, and current opioid epidemic is not as much, um, but maybe because um, more women are addicted, um, more older generation uh, people are addicted, and um, maybe there's less street corner and uh, meetups and more texting to get the drugs. So maybe the opioid um, epidemic isn't causing quite as much violence as what uh, drugs have caused in the past. Um, I thought it was interesting um, what we do. He did touch, and a slide that I didn't put in here was um, the, he touched on uh, fentanyl coming into the ER and how dangerous that is. So mentioned that PPE is a major ish concern. You want to make sure that you have PPE um, available for your healthcare workers. Make sure that you have buddies when it comes to um, response and caring for these individuals. Um, close interaction with EMS. Um, we need better research in hospital care and better identification tools um, regarding some of this um, information. Um, and so I have, that's actually, I don't have any more slides on presentation. So I'm going to let Keith talk a little bit more on his presentation and then. <coughs> The, re the reason Christy doesn't have slides on, on my stuff is because I did not get them to her in time. So this is all my fault. But there were two other sessions that I, uh, like Christy said, we weren't, of course, able to get to all the sessions. But there were two more that I went to that I wanted to touch on real quickly because I thought, I think they're important. And um, that's one of the nice things about being able to run our own conferences. We, we get to pick the stuff that we think is fascinating. So we invited a, a person named Denise Bowling, who works at the UNL, uh, University of Nebraska Lincoln Public Policy Center. And Denise has a, a really interesting background in that she's a PhD psychologist. She has worked in public health. She has worked in direct patient care. She uh, has worked in disaster response on, in the behavioral health component. And for a while, and I don't know if this is still the case, but for a while there, her application for behavioral health uh, support uh, following a disaster to FEMA was actually the template for the country. So she's fascinating, and, and, and that's where I met her. But the thing that she's doing now a lot of is threat assessment. Uh, behavioral threat assessment and working with a, a group called the Association of Threat Assessment Professionals. And her, uh, her role in that is to do a lot of work on the accreditation process. And she gave a presentation on integrating prevention of violent extremism and public health activities. And I've, I've heard Denise speak several times and um, uh, some of the, the kind of highlights from that presentation are that um, when you think about prevention and, and violence, it's almost hard to wrap. For some people, it's almost hard to wrap their heads around that. But some of the research that's being done is that what they're discovering is that after, uh, uh, after a violent incident, people close to the perpetrator uh, report having noticed changes of behavior or changes of attitude or uh, posts to social media and things like that that in hindsight are uh, seem obvious to them. But in foresight, not so much. So what do they do? Well, um, the, the, one of the issues was that if, they, if people uh, do actually report information, um, they don't know who to go to that can do something. Uh, sometimes law enforcement will, will, and law enforcement is actually changing their attitude and, and procedures on this too, but sometimes for a while their law enforcement will say, well, no crime's been committed yet. Um, what we have is a Facebook post and a change in behavior, but uh, we have nothing to act upon. Um, and that's changing. Law enforcement has become more engaged in threat assessment and uh, uh, violence prevention are getting a little more... Uh, active in those types of situations. There are things that can do. If, you, if you're on a, a campus or in a health, large healthcare facility uh, uh, or an academic campus, many of them actually have threat assessment teams where this type of information can be taken and uh, actions can be taken without necessarily a crime being committed yet. So 
it was fascinating to hear her talk about some of that. Um, another kind of barrier to reporting is that, uh, quote, no one wants to be a, a snitch. So there's this uh, fear of being wrong. There's this fear of exposing someone that they know to the authorities when they're not sure that they're actually a threat. So there's it's 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 a fascinating and um, very true in terms of uh, you know we have some barriers to this, uh, and I think probably rational barriers. I don't think these are you know crazy concepts that 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 people shouldn't have in mind, oh, just tell on everybody. Well, I don't know. That's That might not be the right answer either. So um, it was a fascinating talk, and Denise does a great job. And again, those slides are on the on the website. Um, and we will have, actually, Denise Bulling, the person who gave the presentation, is a part of our board, so she will be involved in, in future presentations, and uh, I'm glad for that. She's fascinating. The last one that I went to that I really wanted to mention is um, it's called Dealing with uh, Threats Facing Healthcare Today, Cyber Threats and Regulators. Um, the, the talk that was, and this was done by a, a gentleman named Al Berman, and he's actually with DRI, if you're familiar, familiar with that, Disaster Recovery Institute International. Um, and his conversation was especially fascinating to me was a couple of items. Um, first thing he said that really resonated with me was that everywhere you are, there's a device. Whether that's, you know, your cell phone, your, uh, oh, what's the Amazon thing, your laptop, your little Amazon device that sits in your kitchen, Alexa, uh, all those things, there's, they're everywhere. So uh, everywhere you are, there's a device. And industry is actually coming to recognize that. Um, I, I'm sure you've all heard about the healthcare organizations that have had their data, their patient records ransomed back to them. I mean, it's it's frightening what's going on. Industry is looking at this much more seriously too. And in 2013, uh, cyber threat wasn't even on their top 10 list. And in 2014, it was number eight. In 2015, it was number five, and in 2016, it was number three. So it's you know it's moving up the charts with a bullet, for lack of a better phrase. Uh, people are really recognizing that the Internet of Things is what it's called. Um, oh yeah, connected pacemakers and AICD. Oh yeah, good point, Paul. All that stuff, absolutely. That yeah, it's astonishing how much there is out there. Um, the Internet of Things is uh, incredible. Um, I, and my probably favorite story about this recently is, I don't know if you're familiar with this, but it's the episode of South Park, where South Park actually built into their dialogue for the show the word Alexa, and started saying things like, Alexa, get me a pizza. And across the country, Alexa's in people's living rooms were ordering them pizza or whatever it is that, and they did this many, many times throughout the episode. It was a, a brilliant idea. It was hilarious, but <laughs> it was probably the easiest way to tap into people's Alexas that we can even think about. So this whole internet of things is uh, a fascinating topic for me. And uh, it, and it was one of those presentations that made me walk out wanting to throw my phone in a river. Now, the key point here is I did not go out and throw my phone into a river. And, oh, John, that's hilarious. John's a South Park fan. That's good to know. <clears throat> I did not throw my phone into the river, and um, I, I kept it. So it's still on. It's still functioning, and I still, you know, leave my – uh, leave my uh, tracking, my location turned on so I can get my car driving. I mean, I know all this bad stuff, and I still wear my Fitbit and have my phone on, and it's uh, fascinating. So anyway, that was a great session, too, So, uh, and, and particularly the, the parts that re, re, uh, related directly to healthcare. Awesome. I love that the conversation on the um, chat now is it's going about to South Pisa. Park. <laughs> um, <laughs> That's why we like they, our members. They have lost on <laughs> Good timing. Uh, so 
in summary, uh, we heard from a lot of really great speakers. Uh, we had an opportunity to network with people that have similar roles in healthcare across the country. Um, we are uh, hopefully, and our goal is is to continue continue to foster uh, education regarding preparedness uh, and foster continued research in the field. Um, and uh, we just wanted to also let you know that planning for AHEP 2018 is happening uh, currently. Um, so Keith did mention that we have an education committee and we have a new research committee within AHEP. Um, we also traditionally have a, a conference planning committee. We will be opening up applications for that conference planning committee uh, in the upcoming months. Um, and uh, we are, you are the first to hear it. You're hearing it here first um, uh, that, that we're moving ahead with this. Um, but let's see. Before, for yep, before we, before we go, we have a couple of, so first we wanted to open up this polling question. What do you want to see at AHEP 2018? So I am not only asking you to just pick your favorite here. But you can go ahead and pick your favorite, and it's only going to let you pick one, so pick your favorite. Uh, I, I don't have a lot of um, capability with this poll. Um, but also, if you have topics that you really want, uh, start chatting them, and we're going to take a look at what you guys, I mean, you guys are, are having an opportunity to provide some feedback right away. Um, and right now, as we start making some plans for, for the conference, uh, the upcoming conference, uh, looks like so far we have um, a strong interest in lessons learned, um, specific preparedness topics, um, maybe a little more CMS um, and uh, disaster exercise. Um, so looks like uh, these are some of the interests. I'm going to broadcast these results. You can keep voting if you want to. Looks like there's some workshops. Um, and, and feel free to just keep commenting on those. Um, and the last thing I want to leave you with is, is that um, thank you. And we have a 2018 AHEP annual. We have dates. Um, I will announce the place probably this week or maybe next. Um, we're still figuring out that, negotiating. But um, November 6th and 7th, you can get this on your calendar. Uh, we're going to do pre-conference sessions on the 5th, and it's going to be in Phoenix this year, so next year. So uh, it will be warm. and. Um, I actually just had an opportunity to do some site visits in Phoenix. It was nice. The hotels that I have to choose from are nice, and they all have swimming pools. <laughs> so there's <Yep>. that. <laughs> Keith in a swimsuit, that's what you want right there. <laughs> yeah. um, if you would, um, Christy and I put the, actually had the, had the idea for this webinar. A while. Actually, Christy had the idea for this webinar as kind of a, synopsis of the conference for those of you that either couldn't go or you know didn't get to see everything you wanted so we really um kind of struggled with how do we condense two days into an hour as christy said at the, be at the beginning of this so um let us know if you have ideas for how we can improve this i think uh christy's absolutely right this is a great idea to has have as our, our monthly webinar after the conference but i want to make it as useful as possible for folks and maybe Keith just blathering about his highlights is not helpful, or maybe it is. So uh, if you've got feedback on this particular webinar, let us know. All right. Excellent. Well, I'm going to leave this webinar open so that you guys can continue to provide feedback, and we're going to continue to watch your comments and uh, be interested in all of the things that you have to share with us. Um, we appreciate you being on the webinar. Uh, those that had... Um, things you like you wanted to share and those of you that maybe weren't at the conference we hope that you uh, got some information from this webinar that a uh, helps you do your job in the future um, and B maybe helps you know what to expect at upcoming uh, conferences as well so thank you for your attention today and we hope you have a wonderful holiday season